Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Rob Krugman. Rob is the Chief Digital Officer of Broadridge, a global fintech leader with $5.7 billion in annual revenue that offers communications, technology, and data and analytics solutions that help transform clients' businesses. Rob has held his role for seven of the 13 years he's been with Broadridge. In that role, he leads digital strategy, design thinking, and innovation. He's also passionate about the topic of intrapreneurship, bringing the concepts of entrepreneurship inside the company. I look forward to speaking with him about all the above and more in this conversation. Rob Krugman, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. I, I am as well, Rob. Thank you so much. Well, Rob, uh, you are the Chief Digital Officer of Broadridge. And for those who may be less familiar with the company, let's begin there. Provide a bit of an overview of the, the business that you're in, if you would. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, Broadridge is a company that uh, spun out of ADP in 2007. And uh, we provide services to the financial services industry. And really, it fits into two buckets. Um, one bucket is on our, our, our back office processing and operations business, where we help large broker dealers across the globe to run their businesses, whether it's clearing and settling trades, providing wealth management solutions and other solutions for the capital markets and for alternative investment firms, um, providing the infrastructure they need to run their businesses. And so to give you an idea on any given day, you know, on the fixed income side, we might trade, you know, $7 trillion with the fixed income securities, clearing through our platforms, about a third of all US equities. Um, so that, that that's one side of our business. The other side of our business, which is about 70% of our business is our communications business. And our communications business started with the broker dealer community as well, where we worked with different organizations and helping them to distribute regulatory communications to shareholders of public companies and mutual funds has grown into an organization that really helps organizations across industries, across the globe, communicate with their customers, their investors, all different types of information. So we take in lots of data, we analyze that, and we create robust omni-channel experiences that we deliver on behalf of those organizations really on a global basis. And, and you've been with the company for about 13 years now and in your current role for about seven of those. Uh, talk yeah. a bit about your role as chief digital officer. What does it entail? Yeah. So, you know, I think the chief digital officer role uh, varies depending upon the specific firm that you're talking about. Um, at Broadridge, my remit really falls within three buckets of, of, of efforts that we work on. The first is around digital strategy. What technology, informational type solutions are we starting to see on the horizon that can affect our business um, in a positive and a negative way? And how do we actually respond to those? And, you know, people often ask me what I think the word digital means. And in my perspective, you know, digital is really about how do we take technology, information and experience and combine them together to create something better than what was there beforehand. And that's a lot about what we do. It's really like looking at how do we leverage these tools and services to create something better than what is already there. So starting years ago, how do we leverage the cloud? How do we leverage APIs? How do we kind of move to a storyteller mentality when we're thinking about the solutions and the products that we create? So that, that's that one bucket around digital strategy. Um, the second bucket is really around design thinking. How do we think about design as a mechanism to develop what it is that we were building? So, you know, I always joke, I started as a technologist and I became kind of a reformed creative design person because, you know, back when I started, you know, technology and design were often headbutting each other in different directions as far as the way that things should work. I think with the migration towards agile, you know, methodologies, it really starts with design thinking. And, you know, what I have found is that when we forget to ask the customer what they think is the starting point, we tend to guess wrong. When we tend to ask the customer what they think and what's important is starting point, we tend to guess right more likely than not. So from a, from a broad reach perspective, it's around how do we provide a, a design-based methodology that the organization can use across the globe so that our solutions look similar, we're leveraging reuse, but we're creating and we're doing things from the perspective of that end user. And then the third bucket, which is the area I tend to probably get the most excited about, is around innovation. And so what we've done over the last few years is we've created an innovation capability where it's really not around what I would call sustainable innovation. I, I've used sustainable innovation as a requirement or responsibility of product teams. They should always be thinking about their businesses, how they could evolve and how they should change and how they should invest in those businesses. But from a disruptive innovation perspective, what are those emerging technologies and solutions we should be looking out for 
And we should be experimenting with and testing to understand not just how they're going to affect the businesses that we currently play in, but potentially what new businesses could we open up for the organization moving forward. And, you know, from an innovation perspective, people often ask me, how do you measure success there? And I typically look at it in one of four buckets. And the first one I think is the most important. You realize pretty quickly your idea was a really bad idea and you kill it, right? So rather than spending a whole bunch of money, you do some experimentation, you do some research and you say, uh-uh, this is not worthy of our time or, or our money. But the, the other area is really around creating something. And when you create something new, you know, that then it tends to become, did you create a product that maybe sits within an existing part of the organization? Did you create a new business, which becomes a new business unit for the organization? Or um, maybe you created something that needs to be spun off and be a new organization. So there's different ways of thinking of this as we go through the process. That's a great overview. And as you think about developing that disruptive uh, mentality from an innovation perspective, and, and, you, and you provided a little bit of your definition of, of, of how to think about that, how have you formulated a team to be able to, to do that? I'd be interested in some of the, the, pro, the processes or even the skills that were necessary, that are necessary in order to breathe life into what you've described. It, it's interesting. I, from a personal perspective, you know, I tend to think about this disruptive innovation from the perspective of a consultant, because when I kind of started my career, I, I, I started in consulting and I did a lot of work kind of in the dot-com era as one of these digital agencies. We started one, it eventually became something bigger, it became something bigger. And, you know, throughout that process, we met with all types of organizations. You would go through and you, you could almost immediately determine which ones were going to be successful based upon their strategy and their thinking. And, you know, for me, what disruptive innovation becomes about is something good for the customer. It kind of goes to that design thinking mantra. And if it is, it's likely to succeed. So then what do you need from a team as you actually start to build this out and what, what really is required? So I, I think it really comes down to a few different areas that sound a lot like you would find in product, but little tweaks to them, right? So you have an innovation manager, right? Someone that's kind of leading that team that's going to be responsible for shedding that and driving it through the actual process. You need design. You need researchers that are actually asking the tough questions and starting with data before you actually start to build something. And then you need a very, very efficient and agile technology team that can work together. And so you want to create that team. And, you know, I've taken a lot of thoughts from like the Amazon two pizza mentality, right? There should not be more than two pizzas to build that team. So five to 10 people is typically enough. And we want to work really quick, right? In 60 days, we want that team to be able to answer the first question, which is, is this a good idea? And sometimes you have an answer, sometimes you don't have an answer. But when you have the answer, no is actually the answer you want to get to before you get to yes, because you said, yeah, this is not going to work. Then you go through that iterative process of moving from a, an idea to a concept. You're testing that concept. You're actually determining if there's a real business here or not. If there is a real business, then you kind of take the next step to say, let's create a minimal viable product that we can actually put out there. And then at a certain point, you've gone through that entire innovation funnel and at that point, the question becomes, do we hand this off someplace else or do we take this team and have this team run it? So if you think about the way a startup comes together, I think even within an organization, you want to have that autonomy for that team to be able to function as a unit, but it doesn't have to be a very big unit. And that's kind of the key is how do we actually design a team that has the flexibility and the efficiency to work quick, but at the same time, um, have the skill sets that are required to actually enable them to do that. Can you provide, a, it's a great overview. Can you provide um, an example of an idea that, that's, that's, uh, that's been launched uh, and kind of that iterative process uh, uh, to, to guide us through sort of a specific um, yeah. example or, 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 or a specific case of this? So one of the areas, so I mentioned Broadridge is a very big communications company. And yes. one area in particular we do a lot of work in is in the wealth management space. So we work with very large broker dealers and, you know, for years, when we talk to our clients, one of the big things they want to do is they want to drive as much of that communication to digital channels as possible. And for lots of reasons, building a digital relationship, digital engagement, but also the cost of physical communications could be very unwieldy and you want to try to facilitate savings. And, you know, for many reasons, um, the industry as a whole wasn't overly successful in driving that type of, uh, of adoption. And so what we did is we looked at it and the question we started with was, if given free range to do whatever we wanted, what would wealth communications look like, right? If we could start over. And the first thing we did is we started with the end investor and we said, 
Well, what did they get today? And what we found is that if you have a financial advisor, you were getting upwards of 100, 150, sometimes 200 communications a year. So what we started to realize is there, were, there was noise, a lot of noise. We were sending too much content to people. And the problem was that they didn't know what was important and what was not important. And so in physical form, they could walk to the mailbox and very quickly understand this is important. This is not. Put this in the garbage. Read this. In a digital world, they were getting cryptic emails that said, there's a document waiting for you on our website. Come and get it. And so we often joke that we're surprised anyone signed up for e-delivery because the experience was so poor compared to the physical experience. And so we used that as a driver and we said, what are the reasons why there's so many communications? And the primary one was regulatory. There were all these silos, send this out for this purpose, this out for this purpose, this out for this purpose, this out for this. What if we can get rid of all those silos and instead aggregate and consolidate information so we could send less communication, but the communications answered the key questions that individuals had. And how did we get that? We did research. What do people care about? Not surprisingly, themselves. How am I doing? How am I doing against my goals? What do I need to know about that's coming up next? What's happened since the last time you communicated with me? And is there any other types of information I need? If you kind of switch to that mindset, you end up with a solution that the experience is vastly superior to what it replaces, but there's less. It answers more questions. The, the, with the beauty of it, it's a simpler set of communications that actually respond to the customer's need better than what was there before. And so to do that, we put together a team. We had researchers, we had designers, we have uh, product managers, and we started to develop some prototypes. And at a certain point, everyone recognized this was a really good idea. It resonated with our clients. We found a few design partners and we said, we're going to move this out of the lab and we're going to put this in one of the product organizations for them to run with. And for the last year and a half, two years or so, they've been running with it very successfully. Fascinating story. And it brings in a different way uh, to, to light something you mentioned earlier in association with the digital strategy component of your responsibilities. And that was what you refer to as the storyteller mentality yep. of thinking about you know, what is the story we're telling? How do we, how do we tell it in a compelling way? Uh, and, and frankly, if I'm translating it appropriately in the case that you've just described, you know, what, what is the story that we need to play back for our, our or, or, or even uh, tell to our, our clients uh, in order to help them do something in a different way? I want to, I want to um, double click on that storyteller mentality uh, uh, to get a little bit deeper into your insight there, which I find really fascinating. Talk, talk a bit more about the, 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 the necessity to be a storyteller. Yeah, I think, you know, what's interesting is we're a B2B company, right? So we're not a B2C company. And so people are like, well, why are you telling stories, right? You don't really have end user customers. And what I what I actually think is you have to tell stories to all customers, right? Whether they're an other enterprise that's buying a product from you or it's an end customer that you're trying to sell a solution to. And so, you know, when I think about, and I'm going to go specifically to our communications business, we're, we're really a, a B2B to C company. Right. We're we're helping our clients to communicate with their customers and shareholders. And so the only way we're going to satisfy their needs is to truly understand the needs of their customers. And one of the things that we have found in this is happens, I think, across every single industry, it can often be difficult to put on your customer's shoes. Right. Because you get this kind of myopic view, your kind of tunnel vision, if you will, where it's around satisfying our internal challenges. We need to do A, B, and C. Do the customers care about A, B, and C? Because if they don't, the likelihood of it it's succeeding is very, very limited. If instead we can say, hey, we would like to get to A, B, and C, let's start by satisfying the needs of that customer. Understanding what story is going to make them tick and make them adopt and make them do these things. If we do that, there's a pretty good likelihood that it's also gonna satisfy our needs. And so as I think about what we do, where we work with a number of different businesses and helping to communicate with a customer, or we're building applications that our brokerage clients are providing to their own customers for you know, buying and selling and, and facilitating trading, put yourself in the seat of that client, of that end user, and say, what's really important to them? Once you kind of understand that story, you can then create a story on top of it of why that's good for your customer or for your various customers. And at the end of the day, if it's good for the end customer, if it's good for your enterprise customer, there's a pretty good likelihood it's going to be good for you as well. I think, and this is not a new idea. I mean, this is design thinking 101, but um, you know, too many ideas in major organizations start with the loudest guy in the room, right? 
who tends to be sometimes is the most senior person in the room saying, I've got an idea, we should do X. Is X a good idea, right? How about we could start with a, instead of an idea, we say it's a question. Here's a question. I think we could do the following and deliver this type of value, right? Now let's do the research to make that the case. And as you build that research out, what's interesting is you develop this story that I'm talking about and you become a storyteller. So you're no longer going into an organization or a customer and talking about selling solution X, Y, or Z. You're talking about adding value, right? And so one of the, I always joke that one of the best experiences I ever had, I used to work in the data space and we would create data products. And there was one organization I was working for. Uh, we had created this interesting product that was going to be sold to buy side analysts in the uh in the investment community. And when we started the uh, the process, we kind of had created a business model where we said it was gonna be $500 a month for this solution. But then, you know, we did a timeout. We actually brought in a third party to help us with pricing. And we went and started talking to the end customers. And most of these customers were very, very smart um, research analysts that work for major portfolio organizations, whether hedge funds or mutual funds. And we asked them what they did. And we, they kind of walked us through. They said, well, you know, I, I cover a number of companies and I do the following things. Well, we said, well, what if we could give you this? What would that mean? And what we heard is that it meant that they could cover more organizations. So we asked, well, what, what would that mean? It means that I can generate more alpha. And that's interesting. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> like, give us a number. It says, I think I could probably generate a million dollars more value a year. Interesting. What if we charge you 5% for that? Yeah, that's a no brainer. So we had an idea up front that we could charge $500 a month because we just kind of put it in our heads, this is what it was worth because we were just creating a product. When we actually converted it to a story that we could help an organization generate more alpha, and we're gonna ask them to pay 5% of that alpha that we think that we can generate, we took a product that we thought we could sell for $500 and we could sell it for $5,000 a month, right? That's the power of storytelling. A great, a great story in and of itself. I appreciate that. I know from our past conversations, Rob, you um, have developed an intrapreneurial mindset uh, among your colleagues, something you think is particularly important to certainly uh, contributing to the innovation you've been describing as well. Talk a bit about what you mean by that and how you've in fact fostered it. Obviously, there's the entrepreneurial mindset where you're going out and you're doing startup after startup after startup. And, I, and I've done some in my past. I've done a number of startups with some successful exits. The entrepreneurial mindset is a little bit different, right? Because, you know, you tend to be working in a larger organization and coming up with new ideas and services sometimes can be really hard, right? Because you're challenging the status quo. You're trying to do something a little bit differently. And so, you know, I think what's important is, is to teach people across the organization, challenge the status quo and look at things and say, why do we do things this way? Is there a better way to do this? Can we leverage this new technology I read about? Can this potentially drive innovation and implementation? And I think if you start getting people thinking that way and kind of understanding that's okay to ask those questions, you know, not everything could be done, right? That's that's kind of, you know, you don't want to overpromise and underdeliver there. But I do think you can get people starting to look at things a little bit differently. It's not about making the donuts every day. It's around, you know, we're making the donuts this way. Why do we do this, this, and this? Ask those questions, get the answers, because Sometimes the answers are, well, we've always done it that way. And when those are the answers, that's an opportunity for thinking about things differently and entrepreneurship, right? And so that's kind of number one. Number two is really to begin to understand what's the true value propositions that the organization and the brand has, right? And it's going to vary by organization and by market and by, by location. But like when I look at Broadridge, what I will tell you is one of the truly unique value propositions that I believe we have is that we're a trusted organization that works with thousands of financial services companies globally. That's a pretty powerful network effect, right? So what other things can you place on top of that network that provide value and service to our client base um, versus looking at a specific product over here and saying, we're just going to create a new version of that, right? So it's important to understand the different parameters of value. Yes, there are the services you offer, but often the network of clients that you've created and what you're able to deliver on top of that network is equally as valuable, if not more so. And the example I always use here is if you remember in the early days of COVID, you know, Uber, which has an unbelievable network effect, right? They have all these drivers and they have all these customers was the biggest car you know, sharing network or car driving network in the world where they drove you all these different locations. The next day, like literally overnight, 
they became the biggest delivery service, at least in the area I live, I think across the United States, if not globally, and their revenue actually went up. And what they recognized was the value of those relationships that they've established and that network was so powerful that they could introduce new products and services on top of it. It wasn't just about driving someone somewhere. It was about providing other services across that ecosystem because they were a trusted provider. And so I think it's important that you understand those things. And then from an internal perspective, it's around identifying who those folks are and asking them to participate. Because I think you can unlock a lot of value where you ask people to participate. And so one of the ideas that we have is this concept of returnship. Right? Could people kind of join an innovation team and work on an innovation team for a period of time, you know, outside of their regular roles, so that they can actually allow that creative muscle to start to foster, foster it and use it, and then potentially go back to their teams and be able to drive that entrepreneurial type thinking um, in their teams as well. I went all over the place there a little bit. I tend to do that, but I think I got back to where we needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a good insights all around, Rob. I appreciate that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, the collaboration that you foster internally and externally as well. You have a team, of course, and that team yeah. has the 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 responsibilities that you've described throughout this conversation, but you don't operate in a vacuum, obviously, and you, you no. partner uh, tremendously across the organization, but also across an ecosystem beyond the organization as well, uh, external yeah. parties of, of various kinds. Talk about the collaboration that you foster inside and outside the company to aid all that you've described uh, and what you develop. So, you know, on the, on the internal side, it's really around, I find it's around transparency and education because we tend to be looking at things that are a little bit more advanced than maybe the rest of the organization is. And we're starting to understand that. And I think what becomes really important is bringing that knowledge back in but don't not assuming that everyone's going to be an expert day one, right? So I'll give you an example: the digital asset space, right? In financial services, if you ask me what the long term effect of digital assets, crypto, Web three is going to be, I think it's going to be transformational for the industry. I think whether cryptocurrencies, which I do believe have a, a long life ahead of them, are are the component. I look at all the other things that we do in our markets where, you know, whether it's banking transactions or equities or mutual funds or derivative trades, um, a lot of that over time is going to move to blockchain technology. So understanding this is so important, right? Understanding the truths from the fiction, understanding how things work and providing that baseline is going to allow people to start asking those questions that are important internally. So part of it is around transparency and just having dialogues. I think on the, the external side, it's creating a network. And so for us, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do um, is to identify organizations that could allow us to learn, right? And so when I look at that, it starts with venture capital, right? How do we work with VC firms who have a really strong understanding of what's going to be next because they're investing in what's next um, and work with those organizations to educate ourselves and the companies that they're investing the themes that they're thinking about. And the benefit of that is when we need solutions, we can actually work with their portfolio companies to bring those in. So VC is one bucket. The, the second bucket is the university setting, right? So much of what happens globally starts in a university setting with people doing research and coming up with ideas. So, you know, we've established relationships with a number of organizations, like one of the bigger ones is with Cornell, where we sponsor their FinTech program, um, which is on Roosevelt Island in New York City. And uh, we work closely with them to kind of meet with their students, talk to their professors, hear what they're working on, because there's probably going to be value for us as well. And then the third bucket is the obvious one. I think that people don't spend enough time just reading, right? Like it's important to read and read books, read blogs, read news media. Um, and not I'm not talking about news media and what's happening politically or what's happening. I'm talking about within your industry from a technical perspective. Like you can get some really, really powerful information if you just know where to look, right? And so, um, you know, Twitter is obviously going through an interesting moment right now, but it's still a good place for to see what people are talking about related to specific industries and at least identify themes that you can investigate further. Um, but save that time to do your research. And research starts with simply just being well-read on different subjects so you understand how they function and how they work. Well, I, especially in light of of those last points, Rob, I, I wonder as somebody who has reason to look around corners to decipher uh, trends that might be appropriate for Broadridge uh, to to ride and take advantage of, 
What are some some trends that particularly excite you as you look to the future? So, you know, I, I start with digital assets and I'll kind of combine digital assets and Web3 into this kind of big bucket, right? And people talk about cryptocurrencies and NFTs. I'm going to think about it a little bit more uh, broader in the use of the technology. What, what really excites me here is, you know, in the mid to late 90s is when the internet first kind of, you know, came on the scene. I worked in ran along with a, a small team. We put together a small consulting firm. There was five or six of us. And we were working with financial services companies as they were just starting to go online and all the promise of the internet and what that meant. And we got bought and that had several names and <laughs> different roll-ups of different things that happened. But, you know, we went through the dot-com bubble burst. And what we saw after the dot-com bubble burst was arguably the most innovative period that we've ever seen in our lifetimes, right? In a 20-year period, we saw these behemoth organizations come out of nowhere, whether it's Amazon or Google or, or Facebook, Meta, um, uh, a different type of Microsoft, cloud computing, so much innovation happening in such a short period of time. And so what I see with Web3 is really this kind of almost return. Like we're going to go back to the beginning and we have an opportunity to rethink a lot of the things that have been done here around the use of data and really making uh, information an asset and a commodity that's owned by the individual and what that could mean for people around the world to participate in the financial services system and be able to do lots of different things. And so that's kind of like one bucket. The other bucket that gets me really excited is you look at it and you look at the efficiencies that can be realized using these technology, right? If you think about the way back offices work in financial services, where it may take you know a few days to clear a trade and for the money to appear in your account or a banking transaction to take 24 hours or, or 48 hours. Well, the reason for that is technical, right? It's like, the legacy technology was all mainframe based. It took a long time for, for information to be processed. We had tapes that had to be loaded, all these wonderful things that we all remember. Well, with blockchain technology, we can start to clear things real time. And there's no such thing as nine to five anymore, right? These are 24 by seven systems where money's moving. So it opens up and allows more people to participate. And so a, a really wise guy I often speak to once said to me, he's like, I can't come up with a reason why this technology is not going to take over because it solves so many of the inefficiencies. Now, it's not going to be a click your fingers type of moment because it's going to take time and there's going to be pushback from industry and regulators. And that's kind of what we're seeing there now. But I do think the long-term effects of Web3, digital assets, crypto is going to be pretty awesome to watch because it's going to allow us to think about things in a much more efficient real-time way than we can today. So that's kind of like, that's kind of like one theme I look at. You know, I don't think... Anyone's had an interview in the last three to six months that hasn't talked about artificial intelligence as, you know, not a not just a trend, but almost like you can almost call it a tsunami, right? Um, and when I was in a conference a few weeks ago and I heard uh, an advisor to the White House was talking about it. He was an ex, an ex admiral who had recently uh, stepped down from the Joint Chiefs. Um, and he was talking about different threats and he actually brought up AI as an interesting threat, which was kind of fascinating to hear him talk about it because he talked about it in different perspectives. He talked about it and said, you know, first off, you know, there's maybe 200 people in the world that are real AI experts. There's a bunch of people in the ecosystem, but 200 people that really know how to build and to use these things. And like 70% of them are not U.S. citizens, right? So it's kind of like a point around immigration and how we think about bringing more people and educating more people in. But the other aspect is ethics, right? Like there's like questions that have to be answered. What's so exciting about AI is I think people see this technology that is going to allow us to become, I almost kind of look at it becoming superhuman, right? Now, obviously there's always the threat that we end up in a war games like scenario where there's a machine that's making all the decisions. I, I'm hoping that we're smart enough to avoid that. And I think that, you know, the right parameters and rules and capabilities are going to be built around this technology. But the promise is just so strong. If you've played with ChatGPT or you played with Google Bard or any of the other tools that are starting to come out there, it's awesome what they can do, right? And if you haven't, you should be playing with it. You should ask it questions. If, if anything, it could become your assistant to pull information on topics that you want to learn about. Um, and I always, as I told my, my children who are college students and high school students, like that can't be the end game. Like just don't ask it to write a report, but you can use it as a basis to pull information and then you can investigate whether that information is accurate and at least gives you a starting point. And I think that's what we're going to see, at least initially, is it's going to be kind of like this superhuman assistant 
that can work with us to kind of do some of the mundane tasks that we don't want to pull the information and then we can make smart decisions based upon that information. But where this goes, it's going to be fascinating to watch. It's such a powerful set of tools that really we're just starting to leverage and use and understand. So those are like the two biggest buckets I see. The third bucket is just, I'm always going to be this design thinking nerd. And I really do think that more and more when I see business challenges, it's almost always a result of people not thinking about the needs of that end customer first, right? And so, you know, there's so much technology and tools and services being built around it. Um, but it's an interesting area to kind of keep track of and, and you know, keep up the speed on. Well, let's uh, let, let's stay with generative AI and large language models yeah. for a second. Uh, you, you've advised, of course, that uh, people lean towards as opposed to away uh, yeah. from from playing around with it, drawing conclusions about it and so on. Have you begun to assemble a team to do so um, within the company with, with, with the purpose of, of uh, further deciphering the potential value an organization like Broadridge might derive from it? Yeah, we, we know it's so important that we. It, this isn't even an innovation team. We've created an AI team that's outside of my organization to kind of look at that. But I, I do think that, you know, we realize there is value there. I think the question is hype versus value, right? And that's a lot of these things is how do you kind of move beyond the kind of the, the hype and actually get into real business cases that you can solve for this, right? And it starts to get fascinating if you start to think through it. Like, I'll give you an area where my mind goes, and this is not something that we're working on. It's just something that I've kind of, I've thought a lot about is if you think about the asset management space, right? You essentially have, and I'm gonna actually take AI and Web3 and I'm gonna smack them right together and kind of show you kind of the way I think about this. Take you know these large mutual fund complexes that are managing billions, if not trillions of dollars on behalf of investors. And so you start to think about, um, you know, the power of AI and then the power of Web3 kind of coming together. And so on the AI side, the decisions that are being made by the portfolio manager, as far as what to buy, what to sell, what directions to go, you know, is, is based upon research and, and analyst work and teams. And there's only so much that they can cover those teams, right? They're a finite size of people and individuals. So as we start to think about AI, can AI do a job to kind of identify those signals and understand where the real opportunities are better than a human? Or at the very least, provide the signals of where we think those opportunities are. I, I think the answer is probably yes, right? There's going to be more of that. And there's going to, it's going to start to build up that way. So then you have this portfolio manager that's able to kind of have a more efficient way of capturing ideas and, and understanding. Maybe that facilitates more trade, more movements, more understanding. The second part of it is then under the covers, you know, you have this fund that's got $100 billion in assets that's, that they're, this person is responsible for executing trades on and building a strategy around. Well, today... All of those assets are managed by that particular firm. Tomorrow, is that necessarily the case? Right? You know, if you think about the power of digital assets and this ownership and value based uh, internet, as it's often called, could, you know, could a portfolio simply just be, or a fund simply just be a tokenized asset that I buy? And maybe every time, a change is made to that asset, it automatically reflects in my portfolio. So I am no longer, you know, buying assets through this organization, but the assets actually are just a direction because I'm connected to this change agent that's happening up here. And maybe transactional fees are coming that way. So I think as we think about these things coming together, like the idea of the two working together where you could have, you know, a major mutual fund, for example, operating with less than 100 people, yeah, I could see that happening. It's going to take us a while to get there. But if they don't have to manage the underlying assets because they're just basically managing the set of items that you should buy in the percentages, and you can connect to that. And since trades are happening in real time, they send out a signal and all of the different people that are following it do the exact same thing at the exact same moment. It's a fascinating thing to think about the way our markets work. Our markets don't work that way today, right? Our markets work in a much more end-of-day batch-based processing model where there's money managed, there's a custody of the underlying assets and the way the tools work. I think that if we combine these technologies, we start to see a new world start to emerge, um, which is going to look significantly different. I think it opens up opportunities for certain roles. I think for other roles, other roles are going to go away. And there's just, I mean, that's that unfortunately, or that's progress over the last thousand years when something new comes out, you know, when you have a wheel, it's easier to push things. You don't need as many people to carry when you have 
a computer, you know, it replaces people that are actually doing manual calculations. And I think as we think about AI and some of these other solutions it could be integrated with, it's very exciting. Oh, it's, a, it's exciting indeed. Appreciate your perspectives on on how you're how you're thinking about it. I wanted to also ask you in conclusion, Rob, as somebody who has had such a varied a career in consulting and in industry as an entrepreneur, as a chief digital officer, what have been sort of the secrets to your own success as you contemplate your rise to your current uh, set of responsibilities? What have been some of the difference makers along the way that you might highlight? You know, I'm a, a naturally curious person. And so I started my career as a technologist. I was a computer science major coming out of college. And um, I, I still kind of have that technical way of thinking about things and activities. But I think one of the most helpful roles I played was the role of consultant. Because I truly, for my entire career, have viewed myself in that consulting mindset where if we come up with ideas and services to solve and, and approaches towards solving a problem, right? You can't get personal about it. It's not, your solution is not going to be the one that's always selected. But I do have this mindset that says, I'm going to propose what I think we should be doing based upon fact and based upon data. And if you don't want to do it, okay, maybe I'll go do it someplace else, right? So it's, I don't know if it's more of a free agent type mindset, but I think it's this mindset that as a, a consultative mindset is, you're looking for creative ways to answer challenges that kind of maybe come from outside of the way of normally doing things. And so I've also had the opportunity throughout my career to work in lots of industries, right? Now, the vast majority of it has been financial services, but I've also worked specifically in my consulting space. I've worked in creative industries. I've worked in consumer packaged goods. I've worked in healthcare and insurance. And I think understanding the way these different things function and the way these work, what you do realize is that um, copycat is not a big problem, right? Like you should be copying other people's ideas, something that worked over here. Let's think about how it fits over here, or how it fits over here and how it fits over there. So I think that's part of it. I think the last piece, and it's kind of, I think people always say this, I, I always try to learn. Like I am, one of the things I've challenged myself with is if I'm in a role where I feel like I'm not learning, it's time for me to look for a new role. Right. It's just it's not the way my DNA functions. I am not, um, as I call it, a donut maker. Right. I'm, I, I would never be the operations guy. I just couldn't. It's just not the way my mind works. I, I need to be challenged where I'm looking at new solutions for problems. Maybe they're old problems. Maybe they're new problems. But that's kind of the way my head works. And I think by kind of working that way, that's served me fairly well. And, and hopefully people who know me would agree with me. I've been more right than wrong with the ideas and the solutions I've created. <laughs> so. Stands to reason with uh, the heights that you've reached, Rob. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rob Krugman, for a great conversation, uh, highlighting some of the remarkable things you've done across 13 years at Broadridge, some of what you're seeing coming uh, in the future with the innovations that you and your team are, are helping bring about. It's been a really great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation as well.